Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight we're going to be heading into the woods for an unforgettable camping experience. We also have the pleasure of being joined by the incredibly talented Miss Fearsome, who you should definitely check out once this video is done. As is custom, link in the description as well as the end of the video. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I went camping near Solvang, California, with just myself and my 18 pound schnoodle. It was early in the season, maybe early March, and there was no one else in the campground. The campground didn't have any hosts. It was first come, first serve, pay as you stay in a drop box type of place. The campground was on a slope, and there were trees, but the trees were not too thick. So you could see most of the campground if you were on the upper part of the slope. Since I was alone, I picked the campground on the top right. It was a pretty remote area, so in the pitch black at night, everything was good for a few days. We went to the beach and walked, and I did a lot of droning. One day, there was this truck of about three guys that came to the campground, and they were shooting at trees and smoking weed and drinking. They saw me, and was staring hard. I'm female, and started to feel uncomfortable so returned to my tent, and eventually they left. Later that night at maybe 2 or 3 in the morning, I woke up to the sound of an engine, and bright lights. I peeked out of an air vent in the top of my tent, and all I could see was a truck parked right in front of my campsite. The high beams were on, and I couldn't see anything else because it was so blinding. The truck stayed there for about 30 seconds and then all of a sudden the horn sounded. My poor dog who was barking started to whimper, and then shake super hard. I don't know how long they've lasted the horn for, but it felt like forever, and they were revving the engine too. Eventually, they hit the gas and came flying up the slope at the tent. I freaked out and ducked down and picked up my dog. They flew right by the tent, blaring the horn and yelling out the window. They drove by the campground, not on the road, but through all the campsites and through the grassy field area. I don't know how they missed the trees. They shot guns from the windows and did a couple of drive-bys and then drove away. Writing this out now, it doesn't seem very scary, but it was terrifying at the time. I didn't know if they were going to come in and kill me, or rape me. I didn't know if I was going to get run over or anything. The next morning, I left. When I was about eight years old, I was taking my dog for a walk through the neighborhood with my mum, and it was around 11 p.m. We live next to a swampy, wooded area on the edge of our neighborhood in Lansing, Michigan, and I remembered it being very silent and slightly windy, and from down in the swamp we heard somebody whistling at us. It sounded sort of like a bird but each whistle was different enough where the lack of consistency made it human-like. The whistle sounded higher, then lower. I can't really describe it. My mum had a concerned, slightly terrified look on her face, grabbed my hand, and said that we should go inside quickly. I didn't understand because I was too young, but seeing my mum freak out made me freak out too. But after a while, though, I kind of forgot about it. Two years later, I was taking my dog out again, and it was late at night. Now there is a large bush that could easily obscure a person behind it, just next to the front door. And as I was finishing the walk, the whistling noise started up again. Same pitches and same inconsistent, human-like tones. As soon as I heard it, a chill went down my spine as I remembered exactly the feeling of seeing my mum terrified. Looking down into the swamp at something I couldn't see, and maybe she couldn't see either, I ran inside as fast as possible. Years went by, and I thought about it less and less. I've also only told a handful of people, and eventually it slipped from my mind. Then fast forward to last summer. I'm 24 now and have started dating my girl Sarah. We moved out to South Dakota for work and for Independence Day, and we decided to go to Pierre, South Dakota, 
and watched the fireworks along the bank of the Missouri River. There was a free camping spot behind a hospital where you could pitch your tent, hang out and see the fireworks up the river. We were near the end of the campground and there were very few people around us and as it was getting dark, the fireworks began. They were pretty far away, so the illumination they brought was very little, so we had to sit right at the edge of the river to be able to see them better. A huge thunderhead was moving in and a storm was imminent, so the air seemed electric and the wind was picking up. The atmosphere was eerie to say the least. The police boats herded all the other boats off of the river and had left our area to do that elsewhere. Most of the other campers walked up the river to have a better view of the fireworks, but Sarah and I stayed back and were drinking PBR Tallboys and kicking it. Suddenly we heard the sound of a paddle methodically dipping into the water and just then we saw a figure steering a canoe about 20 metres offshore. Sarah decided to go get more beers from the car, leaving me alone to stare at this mystery person, when suddenly, of course, they whistled at me. My entire body was frozen and covered in goosebumps. It was the exact same whistler from my childhood, more than a decade earlier. I looked at the figure, but it was much too dark to discern who it could be. They were wearing a hat, and when they were perpendicular to the shore from me, they stopped paddling, turned the canoe to face directly at me and whistled right in my direction. I was so frightened I stood up and shouted at them. Who are you? But they didn't say anything. They just whistled a couple more times, turned the canoe 180 degrees and paddled out of sight. Now I'm a videographer so I already had my camera by my side and was taking video of the fireworks. As the canoe was almost out of sight, I grabbed my camera and got a shot of them whistling as they went away. When Sarah came back from getting beers, she was very confused as to why I was so freaked out. When I explained, she was freaked out a bit too, and I was convinced we would both be murdered that night. How did this whistling person follow me after 14 years, all the way to South Dakota? Was it a coincidence? Why was it the same whistling noise? Who was that person and where did they go? So many questions still unanswered, and to this day I'm more afraid of being outside in the dark, where I might hear that whistling again. I'm open to any explanations. I'm a 15-year-old living in Sweden. Last summer, me and my dad visited an island located in a very large lake. The island is about 5 kilometers long, and at one of the ends, there's a ferry connecting the island to a mainland, with a smaller town. Me and my dad were going to go camping at a spot on the opposite side of the island. The roads there go up and down quite a lot, so it was hard biking all the way, and about halfway through the roads turned to gravel roads. No one lived this far away from the small town as far as I knew. We arrived at the camping site, made food, put our tents up, and went to sleep. I can clearly remember putting the cooking utensils back in the bag before going to bed. There was a very light rainfall that night, but we slept well. Waking up in the morning, we saw that our bag with cooking stuff was opened up, and someone had clearly gone through it, and there were footprints after boots in the wet dirt. After a bit of arguing, we both agreed that none of us were up that night peeing, and I packed the cooking things. Just to clarify, our bag with cooking stuff was outside the tent under a little built-in roof, probably made for putting bags under, while our bags and sleeping stuff were inside the tent. We both were really spooked after this, and ate something simple and went back to town quickly, which wasn't very fast since the roads were really hard to travel on by bike. Who the hell was that? And what were their intentions? We didn't stick around to find out. When we were teenagers, my cousin and I were thick as thieves. Ryan, Rory and I always hung out with each other, 
be it on camping trips, day swimming at the lake, or just at parties. Summer rolled around and we decided that we would go camping out in the forest, on the Fort Apache Reservation. This was beginning to become a yearly tradition. Last year we had gone camping in the foothills of the San Carlos Reservation, and it was a blast. I was actually sad to return home when it was over. We finalised our plans and decided to pack Rory's pickup, so we could leave early the next morning. We'd packed enough supplies for three days and enough beer for ten. We set off from our home around eight in the morning and parked the pickup in a trail car park. We were all excited for the day ahead and especially for the night of partying. We trekked through the lush green forest and although it was as such, there didn't seem to be many animals and birds around. The further we walked, the thicker and darker the forest became and at dusk we decided to make camp in a clearing that was right next to the trail. We set up our tent, made a fire and cracked open some beers before it was fully dark. Ryan played some music on his portable boombox and we drank and danced around the fire. At 1am we all decided that since this was the first night we should take it easy and get to bed early. We had miles and miles to trek the next day and it would be torture doing it that tired and hungover. As soon as Ryan turned off his boombox, it struck me how silent the forest was that night. The cicadas and birds usually make some noise after dark, but this night was dead silent. The only sound that we could hear was the light breeze blowing through the trees, and a few minutes later, as we were cleaning up the mess, the bushes surrounding the clearing began to rustle. We all turned to face this noise, fearing the worst, fearing that it could be a black bear. We were prepared for this. Rory had brought his handgun to fend off any unfriendly wildlife. But it was not a bear that emerged from the bushes, but an Indian forest ranger. He looked to be in his mid-forties and was tightly clutching a shotgun, covered in ashes, to his chest. You kids shouldn't be out here. This forest is not safe at night, he exclaimed. We came prepared, Rory joked as he waved his colt around carelessly. The forest ranger pleaded. At first light, you should pack your things and go home. This forest, people go missing all the time with no trace. Please, just go home. The ranger stared at us for a second after that, then turned and went back into the bushes. He vigilantly scanned his surroundings as he went, and shortly after the forest ranger left, there was a vile smell on the wind. My cousins and I joked that the forest ranger probably didn't bathe, and the horrible smell was coming from him. Then we settled down in the tent, and all fell asleep pretty quickly. We woke up and noticed that there were some animal tracks through our camp. The hoof prints made them look like they were tracks of a deer, but it was strange, as the way the tracks were laid out made it look like the deer was walking on two legs. I didn't think much of this at the time. I was too excited for another day on the trail and another night partying. But we were scared by what the forest ranger had told us, and we just thought that he was probably crazy. A man who has been out in the forest for too long and has started to believe all the old Indian myths. Ryan suggested that we go camp and deeper into the forest, away from the trail, so we wouldn't encounter that forest ranger again. We all agreed and decided to set off in the direction of the deep forest, far from the trail. The rough terrain made the walk extremely tiring. As we walked, I kept getting the feeling that we were being followed, like something was watching us from just out of sight. We checked for a few miles through thick forest before deciding to make camp early in a natural clearing which was surrounded by bushes. There was a small stream nearby so we could get some water if we needed to. This camping spot seemed perfect. We got the camp ready for the partying ahead and cracked open some beers. I then went to piss in a bush at the side of the camp and as I approached it I spotted an old green backpack. I picked it up and it almost fell apart. It looked like the bag had been slashed by a knife, 
and upon looking inside it, I discovered a map of the area, a rusted pocket knife, and an old metal water bottle. What's this? Rory asked, as he snatched the bag out of my hands. I don't know, I just found it, I replied. It was probably from the last victim of the boogeyman, Rory joked. At this point, Ryan pulled a bottle of whiskey from his bag and exclaimed that it was time to do some shots. We forgot all about the tattered bag after that, and we drank and parted until 2am. When we turned the boombox off, again the silence of the forest startled me. I thought that the forest was possibly devoid of wildlife, and the light crackling of the fire was the only thing I could hear. I didn't dwell on this thought for long, though. I was just ready to fall asleep, as I was considerably drunker than the previous night, and I'm sure my cousins were too. We settled down and fell asleep in the tent. Rory woke me up to tell me that someone was moving about in the camp. Now, I'm not sure how long I was asleep for, but the fire was still lit, so it couldn't have been for more than an hour. It's probably that crazy forest ranger again, here to tell us that the boogeyman is going to catch us, Ryan huffed. He got up, unzipped the tent, and stepped out. And Ryan was frozen on the spot, staring at something when he stepped out of the tent. Ryan, what is it? I whispered. Ryan didn't react to this. His gaze was locked on something outside the tent. Ryan, I whispered a bit louder. Again, he didn't react. Rory and I stepped out of the tent behind him to see what the fuss was about. I looked to see what Ryan was staring at, and I saw what looked like a sick deer's head poking up from behind a bush, looking to the side. We stared for a few seconds, and it turned to face us. At this point, I realized something was wrong. Its eyes glowed yellow, and it looked like it was rotting. Parts of his head didn't have flesh on it, and you could see the bone of its skull. That same vile smell lingered in the air, only tonight it was much stronger. When the smell first hit my nose, I almost puked. It rose up from behind the bush, revealing that it was not a deer at all, but some sort of rotting monster. It stood almost ten feet tall, and its body was much the same as its head. The flesh on its torso was torn, rotting, and you could see some of the bones in its ribcage. It had arms like a human, but instead of fingers, the beast had long, sharp claws. Its legs were like that of a deer, with the same rotting and desiccated look as the rest of its body. Horrified, I dove back into the tent to retrieve my cousin's handgun. I checked it was loaded and quickly re-emerged from the tent. The monster was still staring down at my cousin's. Looking at it, I was filled with dread and terror, and Rory and Ryan were still frozen. I raised the gun and pointed it at the monster, my hands trembling so bad to the point it was hard to target it, even though it was standing still. The monster took one step forward, as if it was going to charge at us, and I attempted to pull the trigger, but it was stuck. I knew the gun was in good condition. Rory always took care of his guns. But the monster didn't charge us. It was as if he was toying with us. It could clearly see how terrified we were, when I heard a twig snap loudly behind us. I swung my head round to see another one of these monsters, just as rotten and terrifying as the first one. It made an ear-piercing shriek and pounced on Ryan, cutting his chest as it landed on top of him. Ryan was screaming and bleeding very badly, and I tried to shoot the gun at the thing on top of Ryan, but again nothing happened. Not knowing what to do, I threw the gun at the monster, hitting it on the head, but it was not phased. It was still over my cousin, tearing him limb from limb. Rory and I ran into the pitch-black forest, fearing for our lives. The creature shrieked again, and this shriek was like nothing I've ever heard. It filled me with pure terror, and I couldn't think straight because of it. I just ran. 
I didn't even have shoes on my feet, and they were getting cut up pretty badly by sharp rocks. We ran through the trees for what seemed like hours, but couldn't have been more than ten minutes. We found an uprooted tree and hid in the hole where the roots were pulled out. After we got in the hole and caught my breath, Rory looked at me. Can you smell that? He whispered. Those were the words he said before his chest was pierced by the long, thin claws. Blood poured out of his mouth, and he looked at me with a confused expression as he was pulled into the darkness. I got up and ran as fast as I could, ignoring the pain from my shredded feet. I could hear his screams as I ran away, and I ran for miles until I came across a road. Luckily for me, a truck was driving down the road, and I ran out in front of it, and it skidded to a stop. Let me in, I screamed frantically. The man opened the passenger door and shot a strange look at me. What the hell are you doing out in the forest at this time? he inquired. I didn't answer. I just jumped in the truck and slammed the door shut, and as we drove away, I looked back at the forest to see two sets of glowing eyes staring at me from the darkness. I told the sheriff this story when I reported my cousins were missing. He told me I was crazy, and I wish I was, but I wish I could unsee those vile creatures or write them off as a hallucination. More than ten years have passed since I lost my cousins, and I have never returned to that forest or any forest again. Whatever those monsters were, they got a good look at me, and I'm sure it wouldn't let me get away again. I went on a camping trip with some friends of mine in elementary school. It was chaperoned by a few adults. We went and camped out near Jefferson Memorial Cemetery, which was literally just an acre of grass situated smack in the middle of the woods. The earth was really uneven. And rumours were abound within my town as to why this was the case. That night, it was six of my friends and four male chaperones. All of them were dads of kids in the group. Anyway, we get the fire going, and one of the kid's dads tells a ghost story about Jefferson Memorial Cemetery. It was about the earth being uneven because it was a mass grave, which was dug hastily by Civil War soldiers who had set up camp in the woods for a week, while on their way to Gettysburg. He said that one by one, soldiers started turning up dead, mangled to death by some kind of animal. The soldiers had no way of knowing, that that site in the woods had been used by a coven of witches who were experimenting with black magic. They had used that location for their dark deeds, so much that it became a place of bad mojo, and it attracted some kind of angry spirit dog. They couldn't get rid of it, so bound it to the cemetery area, obviously before it was a cemetery, making sure it never got out, and be free to roam the forest. And as the dead soldiers began to pile up, they resorted to digging a quick mass grave and just dumped them all in before getting the hell out. As a result, the spirits of the soldiers who reside there are so angry at their fellow soldiers' callousness, you can often hear them wailing in the night and in the trees. It was at this point in the story when the chaperone said, although you can't often tell if it's an angry soul wailing or a demon dog howling. As soon as he finished speaking these words, we heard the loudest shriek come from the woods. We all jumped and screamed. And that's when we all laughed, because we couldn't believe that we all fell for the old one of the chaperones disappears into the woods and screams at the end of the story to get the campers trick. It was awesome. It totally set the mood for the rest of the night. We were ready to commence with the camping shenanigans, but to our dismay, Half an hour later, we packed up and all left in a hurry. I had always thought it was because one of the campers got too scared. I found out years later that none of the chaperones nor kids had vanished into the woods to scream at the end of the story. We left because the adults genuinely had no clue who or what was in the woods that night, screaming at us. So I live on the coast of Northern California. 
My street lies in a small valley with a thick wooded redwood forest on either side. I recently moved back in with my parents to save money on rent while my classes are online, and our house sits at the front of the forest. Many properties on my street extend into the woods, and my family owns about five acres. A couple of minutes walk past our backyard, and you will get to a gorgeous maple grove with a clearing, a fire pit, and some chairs. Since the maple grove is especially gorgeous this time of year, with the orange and red leaves on the ground and the trees, I suggested my boyfriend and I make a small campfire. He loves the outdoors, but hasn't had the opportunity to go camping, having grown up in the middle of town, while my house is a bit out of the way and more rural. So we went on a hike in the forest, and when it started to get dark, we gathered our supplies and headed to the fire pit. We then built a small fire, set out a blanket, and relaxed. Now my boyfriend, as it turns out, is scared of the woods. I used to share this fear, but in the recent years it hasn't been an issue for me, and I just enjoy the time with nature. At every noise he jumped, and I was sort of making fun of him, and reassuring him at the same time, because I know there is nothing more than raccoons and squirrels in the trees, and we are totally safe. He calmed down and we went back to cozying up, making out, you know. And I kept freezing, making my eyes go wide and saying stuff like, Oh my God, what is that behind you? Or, I see eyes, just to mess with him. It got him the first few times, but after a while he just laughed and rolled his eyes. It was all fun and games, until I actually saw something. It was around midnight by this time, and the fire was dying out. We were getting ready to head inside, and I was curled up against him feeling tired, when suddenly I saw this thing out of the corner of my eye. It looked like a tall, dark figure, but shadow dark. There were no features I could make out, like you would be able to of a person in almost total darkness. I just saw it for a few seconds, and I heard leaves crunching like footsteps. The figure was on the taller end of normal, looking about six feet. It didn't look like a six-foot human, though. It looked like a shorter person, stretched to be taller. The proportions seemed off in a way I couldn't, and still can't quite place. It moved a bit awkwardly like a teen boy who went through a growth spurt, and it seemed clumsy, almost as if it didn't have the hang of moving in such a lanky body. Like I said, I only saw it for a fraction of a minute, and heard the crunch of leaves for less. I felt super uneasy, thinking it was someone in my woods who had been watching us. I told my boyfriend to look, but by that time, whatever I'd seen had disappeared. Now I grew up in these woods. I know all sorts of animals, and this wasn't an animal. The figure for it looked like when you place a flashlight at your feet and it makes your shadow long. Hell. I would even accept the shadow of a tree if there had been light besides our campfire. But any shadow cast would be in a different direction, as there were no trees between the fire and the figure I saw. My boyfriend thought I was joking around, and laughed it off, but I tried to convince him several more times. I guess I was the girl who cried wolf, because he thought I was trying to pull off a long-running joke. I even texted him the next day and tried to convince him of what I saw, but he still wasn't buying it. I know it wasn't my parents, my dogs, or really any animal I had ever seen before. It wasn't a weird shadow, because I heard the leaves crunching under its feet, and I don't think it was another person, because the grove is secluded, and I think we would have noticed a person in the hours we were there. I am lost here. I don't know what is in my forest. I don't know what is lurking in the darkness beyond our campfire. I don't know if it was watching us, or just passing through. And I don't know if I was in danger. But if someone has answers for me, I would welcome them.
my girlfriend had invited me on a camping trip to Indian Boundary Campground with her family a few months ago. This campground is on the Cherokee National Forest near a city called Telico Plains, Tennessee. The first few days of the trip went as expected. We hiked, made s'mores and told scary stories, but little did I know that I would be in one soon. About halfway through the trip, we decided to visit the local fish hatchery. Unfortunately, when we arrived, the gates were closed and there were signs out saying that due to COVID, they were shut. On the same bulletin board that these signs were on, there was an oddly out of place, very unsettling picture of a fish with its face cut straight open. Yes, the face was cut straight down the middle. So all that could be seen was the skeleton of the fish. There was a text on that picture and it read, look, but it was in some strange font, almost creepy pasta kind of font. That itself wasn't too weird. I just wrote it off as someone trying to play a prank and creep tourists out. Once we realized the hatchery was closed, we decided to change our plans for the day and head to a swimming hole that my girlfriend's grandma used as a child. We arrived to a beautiful clear creek with a rope swing attached to a tree on the bank. An old lady sat in front of the tree smoking a cigarette with a rock on her lap. As my girlfriend and I approached the creek, we greeted the old woman who seemed quite friendly. And that's when I noticed that she was using another smaller rock to etch something onto the larger rock that was on her lap. She eventually left the creek side retreating to her camper, which was about 50 feet from the other side of the creek and joined her husband. They both then sat outside their camper in lawn chairs facing the creek. And it seemed as though they had just watched us from a distance for a good while. I didn't think too much of it. Sure, it was creepy, but they were just some harmless old people. Then I looked at my rock that the woman had been writing on. The word look was carved into it. And I just about crapped myself. Nothing else strange happened throughout the rest of the trip. But to this day, it still boggles my mind. I have no way of explaining these events and still haven't heard of anyone with similar experiences. But damn, the woods are creepy. This story takes place in the Rocky Mountains, just south of Silver Plume, Colorado. It was the start of an evening on the 14th of August, 2018, and more strange reoccurrences would happen the following couple of nights. So that day, a couple of neighbors of ours had gone hiking along the ridgeline of Leavenworth Mountain, just south of town, and I had arranged to meet them up there later that afternoon. My plan was to rendezvous with them in the early evening and hang out until after the sun had set. You see, that night was the peak of the Perseid meteor shower, and it was forecast to be especially spectacular as the moon would be a barely thin crescent and wouldn't obscure the clear dark skies. So I set off on my way with a small pack with limited supplies, as I was going to be relatively close to home. I had a small camelback with a litre or two of water, a rock hammer, and a hatchet, and my new green laser that I was hoping would add more good time viewing to the night's light show. I'd set off a bit later than planned, and the main trails to the top consisted of a series of long and winding switchbacks, so I decided to cut some time by bushwhacking straight up the mountain to meet my friends. However, my plan backfired, as I found myself being slowed down by steeper than anticipated inclines, slippery rock tailings and sheer cliffs. Unfortunately, the cell service is spotty at best in that area, and I was unable to contact my friends until finally reaching the summit around sunset. After a few attempts, I finally got connected to my pals via text, and to my surprise, I'd learned that they had already hiked back down into town as it was starting to get dark. I told them no problem, as I had planned to stay at the top of the mountain until late anyway, so I could count the meteors and maybe they could join me later. They said they were pretty beat from the day's trek, but would let me know after they'd rested a bit and had some dinner if they thought they'd make it back out. This new arrangement was perfectly fine with me. Being the consummate night owl, and having lived in this area for five plus years, 
most of my excursions into the mountains tended to be nocturnal, and I'd spent many a night, some planned, some not, getting along just fine in these precarious mountains, and usually had very little anxieties in doing so. So in this manner, I made my way down the ridge line of Leavenworth to a locally known camping area, Pavilion Point, which from its high vantage point overlooked both Silver Plume and the neighbouring town of Georgetown. In between the two small towns, approximately two to three miles apart, was an old railroad attraction called the Georgetown Loop. I should also mention now that at this time there was a strict fire ban in effect, and that this summer was probably the driest I'd experienced since moving to Colorado back in 2013. There were also several wildfires wreaking havoc in the state, requiring all available emergency resources and failing to adhere to the fire ban was taken very seriously with fines, raging in the thousands of dollars. But that being said, I hadn't planned on having a campfire for the obvious reasons. After settling into a comfortable spot near Pavilion Point, I kicked back and started counting the fireballs. By 9 or 10 p.m., my friend let me know they wouldn't be making it back up the mountain and to enjoy the show and that maybe he would join me the following night. Over the next hour or two, I had counted close to 100 meteors, ranging from quick zips to bright fireballs that would leave these awesome streaks that temporarily froze in the skyline. I was having a blast, and as the novelty was finally starting to wear off, I began hearing some faint noises and rustling about in the darkness of the surrounding woods. I wasn't worried much yet, and was used to hearing all kinds of strange sounds, and knew it was probably nothing more than some deer or a porcupine at worst. But after a few minutes, and as the rustling seemed to be moving closer, paranoia got a hold of me, and I decided to take some action. Typically during similar late night adventures, I would just build a small campfire to scare away any critters, and add some comfort in proximity light to the area. But as previously stated, fires, no matter how well contained, were strictly prohibited. Besides, the fact that I could possibly be sighted and fined, I was more worried about actually causing a wildfire, which I would never be able to forgive myself if somehow responsible for destroying the surrounding woods, which I had now considered home. That's when I remembered that in my backpack, I had that powerful green laser. I wrestled around the pack in the dark for a few moments, and I kicked myself for not remembering I had brought it, thinking now maybe it could scare off animals. Glad to have found it in hand, I started aiming into the dark woods and bushes where I had heard noises. I felt more at ease for a moment, until the laser hit the eyes of some forest creature in some nearby bushes. The eyes reflecting the laser like what you'd see driving a late night dark highway, the deer in the headlights effect. Whatever it was, likely a fox, it hopped, screeched and disappeared into the darkness. I also had with me a small dim headlamp which had remained off the entirety of the night to help keep my natural light vision. I quickly shined it around but it was pretty much useless in illuminating anything further than a dozen or so feet. A bit startled at this point, but not wanting to head down the mountain just yet, I decided to go against reason and proceeded to build a tiny fire pit using the stones around me until I had a foot and a half circular pit constructed with a large flat rock to cover the top that I figured would definitely contain all burning embers and hopefully any light that might be looking to escape. I also stationed my camelback next to it to douse the flames if need be. Still probably the smallest campfire I've ever made, the swaldering twig pile literally the size of my hand still immediately put me at ease. That feeling was unfortunately short-lived, and after a few minutes I was feeling guilty about breaking the rules and possibly putting the area in danger with my small fire. But instead of putting it out, I decided it'd be best to have a quick scout around the area 
to see if I could spot any signs of a possible patrolling forest ranger or nearby campers, even though in my previous five years hanging around here, I had never seen a single soul in this area at night. Deciding it couldn't hurt, I made my way over to a scenic overlook, which loomed a thousand feet or more directly over the Georgetown Loop railroad area, with Silver Plume dimly illuminated to the west and Georgetown to the east. I scanned the surrounding woods, looking for any signs of life, and saw nothing unusual. As my fears of breaking the law, or of sparking a natural disaster subsided, I eased back and continued messing around with the laser, wielding it like a lightsaber and tracing the lines of meteors that were still zipping overhead. As midnight approached, I guess I'd had my fill of shooting stars for one night and decided to take one last look around for fire snitches. As I went over and peered down towards the railroad near the base of the mountain, I noticed what looked like a singular light pop on which quickly turned into two lights, which to my stunned dismay appeared to be heading up in my direction. I was immediately taken aback by the sight of any lights in that area, being that the railroad was closed and didn't allow camping on the premises. The two lights appeared impossibly to be moving straight up the mountain and directly towards me. The preceding incline between myself and the railroad was luckily made up of dense forest with steep, jagged cliffs, and without a doubt had no roads or trails that would lead straight up to the mountain. My initial thought when the lights appeared was that it must be forest rangers on ATVs or dirt bikes or something, and they somehow miraculously detected my small fire, perhaps with trail cameras, thermal optics or night vision. I was baffled that there were two separate lights, as I had knowledge that we had only one Forest Service employee that oversaw this entire geological quadrangle, and it was highly unlikely, rather inconceivable, that they would be on any kind of watch or patrol that night, much less two of them. Regardless, I stared down in amazement for a moment, quickly calculating that even with fast dirt bikes on some unknown secret trail, I probably had the jump on them by at least five to ten minutes. I turned, urgently gathering my things, and dumped the rest of my water on any remaining embers, just in case the fire was what they were after, and proceeded to scurry in the opposite direction on the main trail that led me back towards Silver Plume. I figured even at a brisk walk, I'd be so far out ahead of any pursuers that I needn't worry too much, and made my way without any flashlight or headlamp, as to not draw any further unwanted attention. Was there really anybody headed up the mountain to look for me anyway? It seemed completely improbable, and I was probably overreacting to the movement of some old lights, so I was telling myself. After a couple of minutes, I made it maybe 200 yards down the trail and quickly glanced back to Bavilion Point. To my complete and utter horror, I could see what looked like a couple of bright flashlights darting around from left to right frantically searching around the same area I had built my fire pit. I couldn't believe my eyes, and a deep sense of dread flooded over me. Although thoroughly confused now, I supposed that my fire must have been spotted, and I was likely in a lot of trouble. In this moment, I still believed that the lights had to be some type of forest ranger or law enforcement cracking down hard the imposed fire ban. Realising now that if caught, I would probably receive a misdemeanor citation and be fined upwards of $2,000, I began to run. As I got into full sprint, I reached over my shoulders and grabbed both rock and hammer and hatchet off my pack that had started clanking together loudly. The headlamp around my neck, I would click on, then off, for only a second at a time every dozen paces or so. Like I mentioned at the start, it was very, very dark, and there were many twists and turns along this trail. With that in mind, I realised that taking the switchbacks would not be an ideal way of getting down this mountain, and so started darting down some smaller offshoot deer trails that though tighter and more treacherous, would ultimately get me down faster. 
As I turned and jetted down one of these more concealed byways, I could see one of these lights, which had a hint of purplish fluorescent hue, and looked kind of like a motorcycle headlight, which was headed right down the main trail in my direction. I could also see that the second light had picked a different trajectory towards me from Pavilion Point, making a beeline that, to my bewilderment, shot it up over the tree line straight in my direction. At this moment, my mind felt like it had exploded. There was now no possible explanation for the situation I now found myself in. Things were not adding up in any logical way, not even close. First, the improbability that my fire could have been traced or seen, nearly zero. Second, two rangers or law enforcement in the area willing to give pursuit, also nearly zero. Third, the fact that those lights could traverse what dense and steep mountain face within mere minutes for sure was impossible. And now, one of the lights had taken flight, literally defying gravity in front of my eyes as it effortlessly glided over the thick wooded pines that covered the entire area. All of a sudden, this was no longer about getting a ticket or to be fined or receiving a stern scolding about forest safety and whatnot. No, this was, I didn't have time to think about it. My legs never stopped moving as I squinted my eyes trying to see my way down this godforsaken mountain. I clicked the headlamp on, off, never slowing down, on and off, another dozen paces, on and off. And that's when I felt it, within a split second. All of a sudden, I'm completely weightless. Silence. What's happening? Did I die? Had I been shot or something? And then, I heard a crack smash as my legs hit hard wood and broke through thick tree branches. I relaxed my hands and the hatchet and rock hammer were gone. Sharp pain, and I immediately thought my legs were broken. I was spinning, no, tumbling. One last crash, as I landed on my back against what felt like solid rock, and another lightning bolt of pain. This time my tailbone, as my back end flattened against the rock pile, I felt had broken, and my legs felt broken too. I didn't know what had just happened as blinding pain was now all over my body as I lay my head back for a second to get my bearings. I could see overhead behind me, up about 20 to 30 feet, on what must have been the trail I was just on. The zooming purplish-white light continued down the small deer trail towards town, and half a second later, out in front of me, and slightly downhill, zoomed the second light now below the tree line on the adjacent main trail, running parallel to the one that had disappeared beneath my feet. I lay for a second, wondering if I was dead, then wondering how many bones I had broken, and feeling around my body for a moment with bloodied wet hands. Slowly I realised that I had just run straight off a cliff face, hit a huge pine on the way down, that flipped me into a cartwheel twice before smashing ass first onto a slightly exposed rock pile. Damn it. And I was almost there, having made it about three-fourths the way down the mountain. I tried to move, but the pain made me almost cry out in agony. I slid myself slightly to the right, off of some of the bigger boulders I had landed on, and onto a softer spot of ground. Before I could even think for a second, I saw both lights headed back down the main trail that was located about 30 feet in front of me. I gasped, then held my breath as the lights approached, hearing what sounded like faint, garbled walkie-talkie radio chatter. I quickly reached into my pocket and switched my phone off so it wouldn't make a sound or ping my location. As the lights got closer and passed in front of me, I could finally see what the hell it was that had had me in pursuit for the last ten minutes. Side note. The typical hike down from Pavilion Point into Silver Plume took at least 30 to 40 minutes, 
and I had almost made it down with probably a quarter mile or so before I would have stepped back into the lights of civilization. But no, now I'm stuck on an angled rocky slope, bleeding all over, not sure the extent of my injuries. As I stared out in front of me at the returning chasers, I could see humanoid figures riding on what looked like futuristic motorcycles. But where are the wheels? Why is their movement so smooth and steady? Also, why aren't these machines making any noise? Motorcycles and dirt bikes are loud, annoyingly loud, but these seem to make no sound. Am I deaf? Did I lose my hearing in the crash? No, wait. Did I lose my mind in the smash-up? What the hell is going on? At this moment, I'm not sure if I'm even still alive. Are these postmodern demons hovering around to take me on to the next place? I can't make any sense of it. I can't believe what I'm seeing. No, not demons. I got it. Aliens. That's got to be it. Maybe. Anyway. The hover bikes, which I'll now refer to them as, passed me by seemingly unawares of my banged up presence. It seemed as though their riders had at least abandoned their vehement searching for me. They moved slowly and gracefully now, gliding so seamless and smooth versus the frantic and accelerated pace of our prior melee. I squinted in the darkness to try and make out these riders. Blurry vision. They appeared to be wearing what looked like all white or greyish attire, head to toe, and I hear more faint radio garble, but can't make out the sounds. Is it English? Foreign? Is it even a language? I don't know. I exhaled my breath, which I'd been holding for God knows how long, and tried to calm down for a second. A few moments passed, I think. I don't know how long as I just lay there trying to breathe. What the hell just happened? And what the hell are those things? Who are those people? Before I have any longer to ponder the matter, I see in the trees more hovering dim lights coming back my way. Oh, Jesus. A few seconds later, I see those two hover bikes, now without any headlights on, hovering through the forest on the trail below me. A little further away, I see two more, then three more, further in the distance. Most of the hover bikes passed quietly and just kept going westward, disappearing through the woods. I'm not sure how many I counted, maybe ten, maybe twelve. I felt like my mind was completely broken. This can't be happening. Then just off the trail in front of me, two of the bikes stopped and the riders jumped off. I can see the dim shape of their outlines against the dark forest, and it appears to me now that they're wearing what looks like chemical hazmat suits, like something out of the movie Outbreak or Arrival. They didn't have any flashlights or anything, and it didn't appear like they were still looking for me at all. They stood next to their hover bikes as the crafts started moving very slowly, their occupants walking alongside. Across the side of the bikes, I could see very dim lights slowly flashing across from one end to the other, going from reddish to orange to yellow. Very dim, soft lights. Lights moving from left to right. The bikes hovered for a moment and stopped. The riders now grabbed what appeared to be staffs of some sort, or some kind of tool from the opposite side of their bikes. They both took a few steps from the hover bikes, bent over and started stabbing at the ground. No, they're digging. It looks like they're digging. What the hell is going on here? I kept watching, squinting my eyes, trying not to breathe and too afraid to make a sound, staying completely still even though my body, especially my ass bone, is screaming in pain. But I won't move, not even a muscle. And after digging for a few seconds, the beings returned to the bikes. 
what looked to be small, round compartments running alongside the bikes, think saddlebags but flush and internal, opened up and the contents of their shovels are whisked inside these compartments. I am completely stunned at this point and totally overwhelmed, engulfed in fear, agony, dread, you name it, and I don't know what I'm even looking at. Are these people? Like human people? Are they aliens? Are they scientists? I can't tell with those weird suits they've got on. I watch them work, repeating the cycle, taking samples, inserting samples into craft, moving along a few feet, taking more samples, etc. These hover bikes can even zero point turn, spinning around 180 degrees from time to time. I heard no noise during all of this, no talking, not even forest sounds. At this point, I'm beginning to think I've had some sort of psychotic episode with involuntary hallucinations, fear and paranoia. Maybe this is a dream. It doesn't feel like a dream. It doesn't feel like hallucinations either, at least not from any drug I've tried. Those types of hallucinations have definable characteristics, silver linings, waves, melting, and can be shook off with ease most times. But what's happening right now is none of those things. Maybe this is something new. My mind starts reeling. Am I crazy? Am I not crazy? Is this real? What is real? What the hell is happening? I can't make any sense of it as I sit and watch these things, these beings, these people or whatever, with their bikes or hovercrafts or ships or who the hell knows for quite some time. This is torture. Who are they? Where did they come from? Why are they chasing me? Did I stumble upon something I shouldn't have? How did they figure out where I was? The laser, maybe. If it's aliens, they saw the laser. I don't know. Maybe if it's people, they saw the laser. Now the fire seems to have had nothing to do with all of this. Or did it? Madness. This is madness. I've gone mad. Everything was just fine before all of this. I didn't take any weird drugs today. I don't think, at least. At least not of my free will. How did it go from innocent meteor shower to all of this? Are these military personnel? I've heard other weird conspiracies involving the government doing shady things in these mountains. Is this that? Am I sitting on a top secret research facility? Why are they digging? Why are they taking stuff? Are they testing for something? And why the hell are they wearing those suits? Is this place contaminated? Radioactive? Should I be wearing a suit? Should I be drinking the local water? This can't be real. It's not real. Just stand up and walk home. It's all a figment of your imagination. A mind mess up. A glitch. You've hit your head or depleted your oxygen. Who knows? But it's all in your head. Just stand up and walk home. Stand up. Now. But I can't. They're not real. All these thoughts plus a million others racing through my brain. It all seems so clear though. Clarity. Yes. As I ponder my predicament, I stare up to the sky. And as I look, I see a drone pass over. An honest-to-goodness, recognisable drone. Like, made by humans. I think I can even hear it. It has lights that blink, red, green, red, green. It passes overhead and out of view. Maybe I'm not crazy. I recognised a drone. If I was crazy, things would be getting crazier, right? More outlandish and out of control. But that's a drone. It's real. It's grounding. Well, not literally, but it feels grounding. It feels real. I'll even see a few more as the minutes turn to hours. I wonder what they're doing. Why these people or things are combing the forest, taking samples. And for what? As the hours pass by, 
I witness their workings, and I still feel crazy. I keep trying to convince myself that this is all a hallucination, and that I can just go home whenever I want. Just stand up, walk through these people, these hover bikes and drones. Just walk by, wave and say goodnight. It's simple. This isn't real. If it's not real, then I can just go home. But if this isn't real, then where to home would I be walking? I sit still, focus on my breathing, slowly in and slowly out. As crazy as I feel, there's a part of me that knows this is actually happening, and that I can't just stand up, because then they'll catch me. Why did they chase me in the first place? This doesn't seem to be about fire. What would they have done if they had caught me? Scare me, beat me, kill me. I mean, I was literally seconds away from being nabbed. They had closed in on me. The speed that they were traveling, the trajectory, the other bikes strategically poised to cut me off, all literally seconds away. Then I ran off that cliff edge, total freak out accident. Couldn't have planned it if I wanted to. Total and utter confusion for one quiet second until I hit that tree, and with that, the pain of reality setting back in hard. Would they have run me down with those hover bikes? Would they have shot me? Do they even have weapons? I don't see any weapons, but it is dark and blurry, and I don't know what I'm even looking at now. Confusion, stacked on confusion, stacked on this excruciating pain. All these thoughts plus a million more, so I just lay there and watch, watched them work, or what appears to be work. I wondered if the hover bikes were sensing things in the ground, and that's why the workers chose to dig where they did. I wondered if it has sensors, and if so, why isn't it censoring me? And these drones flying overhead? I mean, I know that cops have had helicopters and drones equipped with FLIR and other sensitive devices that can detect, like, bank robbers hiding in thick bushes. They've had that stuff for decades. So why are these obviously superior vehicles not sensing me laying here? Why have I not been caught? If it was so important to chase me from the top of the mountain, why did they eventually give up so easily? Why can't they see me now? At one point during all of this, one of the suits got within 15 to 20 feet of me, before moving on. Didn't they see me? I thought for a few minutes that one of these people were actually staring right at me. It's hard to tell with a devoid masked chemical suit, but still. It looked like it was looking right at me for what felt like forever. Then they just moved on, digging, grabbing leaves off trees, etc. I focused on my breathing, and at one point I remembered coming up with some mantra, saying it over and over and over again. In that moment, I thought that I would never be able to have another thought outside of that mantra. Funny that now, I can't even recall what exactly I was saying to myself, but I just needed to get through it. If this is real, I told myself, then time, as I understand it, must be real and time meant that at some point the sun must rise. If this is real, then the sun must rise. I suppose then that I can afford to waste a little more time and a little more sanity to see if this is actually truly reality, because if this is, then the sun must eventually rise. So I waited, watched, chanted, breathed, until finally, much to my surprise, I could see the sky shade changing just a little lighter than the darkness, just a crack of dark blue, and finally, blue. Then the stars started to disappear, and with the hint of dawn, I heard sound coming from the whoever-whatevers and quick chattering sound garble, and then I saw them hovering by, one by one, just as they had come, going east towards Georgetown. Hovering along the trails below the tree line, I tried to count as they went by, hoping to note when the last one was finally gone, quickly realising I didn't really know how many had come. 
and so I sat, still perfectly still, and the dawn rose. I had made it this long, I could make it a few minutes longer. To be snagged at this point, caught, would be unforgivable, no matter how painful. And so the dawn came and went, and the sun rose, and when the sun rose, so did I. When I finally stood up on rubbery limbs, I could barely keep my balance. I looked down to see both legs of my pants were completely stained in blood below my knees, but I didn't care. I felt around to my tailbone, which now had a golf ball sized knot that ached with such ferocity. As I looked around, I could finally see what had transpired just hours previously. I found my tossed rock hammer and hatchet close by. Finally, I climbed back up to the shortcut deer trail that I had run off of, saw the tree that I had clipped, missing huge broken branches at knee level. I looked around the area where I had landed at large sharp protruding boulders and other broken branches with points that would have impaled me if I hadn't landed on the rocks exactly where I did. Holy crap, I should be dead. I gathered my things and started limping home with mind still confused and reeling, but alive no doubt. I never felt better to be climbing the stairs to my apartment, beelined straight for my bed, about to pass out from exhaustion, when I realised I had an appointment in two and a half hours to get my hair cut. Well, at least I can power nap an hour before trying to explain to my hairdresser why I can't even sit in her chair. Oh well. And that's just the beginning of a story that would unfold over the next couple of days, here in the Colorado Rockies, surrounding Silver Plume. I always wanted to try the car life thing after watching so many YouTubers who live in their cars and travel around the country. I lived in Fort Lauderdale for five years and thought I would be stuck there, and that was it. Then the pandemic hit, and when I checked my bank account, I was paid back thousands of dollars. Before I knew it, I was packing up all my stuff and the landlord said I could leave all my furniture, and that was fine. I'm now on the 95 heading north laughing and actually leaving and I couldn't believe it. I managed to get a hang of the whole car life thing and became more comfortable with stealth parking in different places and not being detected. I hadn't done any off the grid stuff yet, but was more comfortable by the time I reached Lake Tahoe. I was hiking and asked some guy with his dog if he knew a place where I could sleep in my car, because Tahoe seemed tricky. He said there was a place up in the mountains called Hope Valley. It sounded good, so I went. Lake Tahoe is already very high in altitude, so this was a few thousand feet higher than that. It was this past July. As I reached the area, I saw a small parking lot that was an entrance to a wildlife nature preserve. It was closed and empty, so that would do. I'm all settled in with my blankets and the sun is setting and the temperature plummets. Before I know it, it's pitch black and visibility is zero. I start to hear wolves howling, and at this point I'm game. This was the experience I wanted. It was a little creepy, but I was fine. I was living what I normally would be watching on my YouTube in my apartment before the sun went down, and then I noticed the garbage cans that were filled over 15 feet from the car at the entrance to the preserve. I finally drifted off to sleep and was awoken by something around 3 a.m. You couldn't see anything anywhere it was so dark and then i heard heavy footsteps right outside my door at this point i'm crapping myself then something brushes up against the car and i'm scared and don't know what to do i wait for a few minutes then i open the door run around the car as fast as i could and got in the driver's side i drove down the mountain and slept in a motel 7 parking lot like a baby never made it through my first and only off-grid car camping adventure and I won't forget it. The only other time that trip that something creepy happened was in Mount Shasta. I drove halfway up the mountain, parked on the side of the road and got out and started walking in this trail. I made it about 70 yards and heard a low growl. I've never run so hard back to my car in my life. But the rest of the trip was the best hiking I've ever done in Montana. 
So I went on my first camping trip this past Monday and Tuesday with my sister-in-law. Monday was setting up camp, then Tuesday was packing up camp, hiking, then heading home. We were camping in the Cumberland Gap area of Virginia, so we were very close to the border of Tennessee. Now while I have never gone camping, I've read a lot about animals growing up, and I am able to identify what sounds they make pretty easily and I can identify their tracks and droppings. I read a lot about mythologies, legends and folklore, and I believe in certain things that just don't seem like they can be explained by logic and science, and I have believed in most of these things for a long time. My sister and I set up the tent while there was still some light, but since it's November, the sun sets earlier. The bathroom showers were no more than probably 30 to 40 steps away at a brisk pass, so there was light from there, and we could easily see people's RVs at their camping spots. While she went back to get the payment set up for our site, I collected nearby fallen branches for firewood. It was dark now, and I was using her headlamp, and I couldn't help but feel like something was watching me, but I shrugged it off as soon as she was back in less than 10 minutes. With it having rained recently, making a fire didn't go as planned, so she used her small camping stove and we had soup, chatted, then looked at the stars. We settled down for bed around 7.30 to 8. It was going to be 25 degrees that night, but we had cold weather sleeping bags and we both soon went to sleep. The usual noises I heard were dogs from other campsites and crickets. Not much anything else for a while not even an owl. Sometime around what I think was nine or around ten, I was woken up to a sound I had never heard before and it sounded like it was coming from several yards away. It kind of weirded me out at first and I listened carefully to hear it again. Then about five minutes since the first initial sound, I heard it again and I tried to think what was out in Virginia that would make that sound. I couldn't think of any animal that made it. It sounded like a grunting kind of yowl, and it really did send a shiver up my spine. Something about it didn't sit right with me. I know it's possible, however unlikely it may seem, that it could have been a mountain lion. But I've heard the noises they make, and that was most definitely not a mountain lion. I heard it a bit more, and it sounded closer but still wasn't very close to our campsite. And eventually after over 15 to 18 minutes, I didn't hear it anymore. And nor did I hear leaves moving or twigs snapping. It was like whatever made the noise had vanished. At around 11.30, I got out of the tent to use the bathroom and I took my phone to use the flashlight and quickly made my way to the bathroom because it was very cold and I wanted to get back to the comfort and warmth of the sleeping bag. I didn't hear the noise, but I had the uneasy feeling of being watched. I hadn't even really thought about what I'd heard earlier, so I know it wasn't paranoia. I still got back to the tent quickly and went back to sleep until morning. I didn't talk to my sister about it, because I wasn't entirely sure what I'd heard and I've wanted to write it off as nothing but just nature at night. But I can't help but think about it now. I didn't feel like we were being watched on our hiking part of the trip, and for that I'm grateful, because I don't know what would have happened if we had been watched by something out there. I don't know what made that noise out there either. But all I can say is that we were literally in Daniel Boone country, right by the border of Virginia and Tennessee. I've been hiking with my dad on the Blue Ridge Parkway, and I've never felt like being watched, or heard, nor come across anything odd there. But if anyone may have an idea as to what I heard that night, please comment, because honestly, I've got no clue. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. Please give a huge thank you to Miss Fearsome for joining us in tonight's video. I really enjoy her narrations, and if you do too, be sure to show her some love. Link on screen soon and in the description. To check out some of her 
awesome content. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to my members and patrons, also names on screen. If you'd like yours on screen, well, you know what to do. So the one of the secret projects I'm working on is coming on nicely. Um, members and patrons, stay tuned. I'll have an update for you in the next few days. Really excited. But for now, that link is on screen. So check out Miss Fearsome, give her your sub, and hopefully I'll see you there. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.